Hello, and again, welcome to Bit Depth. I'm Santiago Ramones. Perpendicular to me is Jeff Newell. Yes, I, yeah, you, you say your name there. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah that's why you pointed <laughs> at me. Yes, that's the the good old hand gesture, doing hand gestures on an audio podcast. Uh, <laughs> hi, <laughs> hello. <laughs> um, how do we know each other, Jeff? Uh, we know each other. We've been best friends since <laughs> middle school. Yeah, and it was actually just by sheer coincidence. Um, we were in a class together, and like our, our like homeroom. Home yeah, yeah, it was a homeroom class. We had to get a locker buddy for homeroom and they had to be in our homeroom class and Santiago just came up to me and was like you want to be my locker buddy and I was like I don't know anybody else in here so yeah you seem pretty chill yeah, sure we, we didn't know anybody <laughs> else in here so <laughs> the rest uh, is history yeah and then we made some hilarious uh YouTube videos which may no longer exist or some they might they yeah. do well, there's a know. lot of there's a lot though that we had made that weren't we never published but I right, still right. have them on my well, Old computer somewhere buried yeah. in a flash drive. You'll you'll have to dig through the depths of YouTube to find those. Uh, <laughs> no, you won't. Actually, yes, you will. Uh, if yeah. you see the video with forty two views, you got it. Yeah. Well, there's there's so many videos on YouTube that have forty two views. <laughs> <laughs> they don't need to know that. Yeah, including uh, no, I don't think any of my podcasts that are on YouTube have that many views. So <laughs> we need to change it. Well, people mostly listen to the the Apple Podcasts app rather than the that's true, that's true. YouTube. Yeah, most people don't use YouTube for podcast yeah. stuff. Well, anyways, hi Jeff. Hello <laughs> again. Um, what do you do? Uh, like what am I doing right now? I mean, yeah, like what do you what do you do? What do you, what are you going for? <laughs> <laughs> what am I shooting for? Well, um, I'm going to uh, I'm actually back in town in Oklahoma City for a few weeks for the holidays, but. I'm living in Lincoln, Nebraska, going to graduate school up there. I just started um, this fall um, getting my master's in music and clarinet performance. And that's, I guess, essentially what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Trying to be a uh, one of the lucky musicians in the performing arts, trying to do some symphonic work in yeah. an orchestra or something. and a just Professional clarinetist. Yeah. Is that the word? So about as close as it'll get, yeah. Or uh, that is the clar- word. No, I know, but clarinetist. <laughs> no, uh, no, it's not like a flautist. Yes, <laughs> it's not like that. But uh, yeah, I did did that. Um, before that, I got my undergraduate over at Oklahoma City University, and mm-hmm. that was a great time. And I'm happy that it's a lot warmer here than in nebraska because it's really cold up there right now it's like I negative mean, 10 it's pretty cold here but yeah it's not negative 10 gladly <laughs> <laughs> um yeah you're pretty good at clarinet i'm all right yeah uh, no you're more than all right that you're very very good uh <laughs> uh you've been very very good for a long time and uh i i really can't i mean i don't know i just heard you play a little bit earlier and i was like damn that's pretty good <laughs> thanks thanks appreciate it i would hope so that's what i'm what i'm going to school for yeah exactly um i hope i'm at least all right at it <laughs> yeah yeah so to start with uh how did you choose clarinet well of all the things funny to play. thing about that <laughs> i didn't choose clarinet clarinet chose me so in middle school uh i actually didn't even want to do music i was forced by my parents to okay. do music and they were like, it's good for you because you need to quit just sitting on your butt and doing nothing. <laughs> and I was or like, okay. Playing video games. Yeah, that's or... pretty much what I was doing. It that or, that or playing outside. Yeah. Like I'd play basketball like all day in sure, elementary yeah. school because I was fortunate enough to have a basketball goal. Yeah. One of those cool kids. <laughs> so I was using And live in a cul-de-sac. Right, yeah. So <laughs> got to use it all the time, all the free space. But yeah, so anyway, back to what we're talking about. So... um. I wanted to play. I was like, fine, if I got to play something, I guess I'll just bang on some stuff. I'll do some percussion. I really actually wanted to play snare drum because mm. I just I used to listen to like the drum core stuff with like the drum lines. And stuff, and I really liked all the snare licks and stuff. And, mm-hmm. I, and I also really liked jazzy stuff at the time, too. So I want to do that or saxophone. So. You know, you 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 know, I would say middle school, you know, all the testing yeah, yeah. and stuff that they did. They yeah, like these, it's like you like pick your three that you might want 
Yeah, and then they like tested you on everything to see if it was even in a good decision. <laughs> right, right. And uh, <laughs> I did all the woodwind stuff. And they're like, that was really good. And I was like, good, I don't care about that. Yeah. And then I went to... Can I be percussion now? <laughs> and, then I went, and then I went to the brass and I couldn't even make a sound. And I was like, nope. <laughs> right. <laughs> not not <laughs> for me. And they were like, you're right, not for you. <laughs> and I went to percussion. I'm like, wow, you got good rhythm. And I was like, yes. So I, I went home that day thinking like, I'm going to be a percussionist. Right. Yeah. And I come back the next day and they hand me a freaking clarinet. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, why? And they're like, you're, you're going to do good on it. And I was like, okay, I, I hate this thing. <laughs> yeah. I, at the time, I like thought all the depressing people played clarinet. <laughs> well, that's because Squidward plays clarinet. Right. SpongeBob probably ingrained the that. The only context my... that anyone ever has of clarinet <laughs> right. is a very depressed person. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that's what I probably had to subconsciously, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> and then walking into the room kind of fulfilled that for me because I, I picked up my clarinet and I put it together and I went with all the other clarinets and they all like had their heads down and stuff. And I don't know if it was just, you know, you know, typical sixth grade people not wanting to socialize because right. they're trying to find themselves or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I hated it, and I always got first chair, and I hated it, and I didn't start liking it until, like, high school. But I was actually going to quit in middle school, like, after eighth grade. Mm-hmm. My parents were like, nah, you've gotten better. You should just keep doing it. And I was like, oh, fine, because I wanted, to, <laughs> I wanted to please my parents. And it was actually kind of weird. I never – I wasn't challenged very much. I'm sure a lot of other, you know, musicians – or any people that are have a natural somewhat ability to what they do can understand this at any context. But, Mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't challenged, so I was bored of it. And I thought, yeah, 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 I thought that's all, all it was Mm because it's all I knew. And, uh, come to find out one year in in our, in our state solo ensemble contest, um, they, they always have the local music stores always come together and they have like booths and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I happened to just have 20 bucks on me. I was like, you know, I'm going to buy some music. And I kid you not, I picked something that's way too hard for me. Mm -hmm. But I picked like an undergraduate level collegiate piece. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, (laughs) a sophomore in high school and wasn't ready for that. But I literally picked it up because I was like, oh, there's a bunch of black. So I bought it (laughs) and started playing it. And uh, That looks like too many notes. Let's go. Right. Yeah. (laughs) And then I was like. And I started listening to recording stuff, and I was like, wow, you know, music can actually be, like, this type of music can actually be really beautiful, like other types of music mm-hmm. that I like. So Yeah, yeah. Lo and behold, I'm, I guess I obviously like it. I'm yeah, yeah. still playing Still, it Still going, still paying trying, lots, yeah. lots and lots of money to continue doing it. Yeah, and trying to make it, you know, something permanent. So, yeah. Yeah, that's how that started. Um. So, I mean, there's... This is something that I've noticed for like classical musicians uh, a lot of the time is that a lot of the time classical musicians don't even really like classical music. Yeah, <laughs> it's a true thing. I yeah, mean, you you kind of and you know this may be from ignorance too, out of my perspective, because obviously I've only been in a few atmospheres of mm-hmm. that rather than you know since I'm trying to give myself a foundation, I don't get the courtesy of the blessing of being able to like, mm-hmm. you know, meet all these people all the time and everything. I just right. got to go to things and hope that I get a good experience, which yeah. know, I'm hoping I will. So that's a good thing. But yeah, from my experience, either classical musicians are obsessed with instrumental music. Right. Or they don't really care about it. All yeah, much. yeah. And I kind of, I'm kind of sitting somewhere on the border, more on the, obsessed side yeah but i don't want to over obsess over it because i think um other types of music can influence like mm-hmm. you can incorporate other types of music into what you do on your instrument exactly if you would just l- allow your mind to stay open to these other genres and other styles yeah, yeah. you know you you grow as a as a musician it's better mm-hmm. to be more well-rounded like that rather than i'm only going to focus on like Beethoven or oh I don't like classical music so I'm only going to focus on like Penderecki or Stravinsky or <laughs> you know crap like that you right know, not right that it's crap but you know, <laughs> I just I don't know I've I've always tried to not subject myself to one specific goal other than you know obviously to perform at some level 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so then, what has been some of your favorite music that you've been a part of? And so, what's been your favorite ensemble piece? My favorite ensemble piece? Yeah. Oh, that's kind of <laughs> hard. I've liked everything so much. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think my favorite overall experience was in my undergraduate. Um, we would always do chair placements four times a year, um, which to my knowledge is a lot for a school because the school I'm going to now only has two <laughs> a year. Yeah. And, uh, you know, per semester. And uh, now I'm losing my train of thought. Oh, yeah, best experience. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, they, we always had to pick auxiliaries and stuff, and we just got we got picked, you know, by somebody else to play it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was picked to play E flat clarinet, and this was my sophomore year, my undergrad. I was like, I, I have no idea what the heck this thing is. Like, I knew what it was, but I never right. played Real it. Real quick, explain yeah. what is the difference so, between I will, a B flat I, clarinet I will. and E flat or whatever. So, so <laughs> a B flat clarinet's like the usually the standard clarinet clarinet. that you (laughs) will see most of the Mm -hmm. time or that you, if you're in middle school and you pick up a student instrument, that's a clarinet. It's usually a B flat clarinet. Mm -hmm. If it's the bigger one, it's usually a bass because nobody plays alto clarinet. It has has the weird little bell thing. There's one in between them called an alto clarinet, but most, most of the time you're not going to play it unless you're in like a clarinet chamber setting or once you get further into it and you already know what these instruments are. Right. Um, you know, bigger ensemble pieces like mm-hmm. an ensemble, you know, because they get different colors and stuff. But an E flat clarinet is smaller than mm-hmm. the B flat clarinet. And as a result, it's higher in register. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and it's a lot harder to, to play because it requires um, playing clarinet. You know, you got to have a lot of working resistance. Um, mm-hmm. You have to have enough, you know, I don't want to say tension because it's not really the right word, but you got to have enough. I'm just going to say it anyway. Tension in your face <laughs> to at least create the embouchure and create, mm-hmm. you know, everything. But you have to have the rest of your body be completely relaxed. Otherwise, right. you can't play. It's almost, you know, you won't be able to focus your air mm-hmm. if you're tense everywhere else except for where you need to form your your face to be able to play the instrument. So. Yeah, yeah. But on E-flat clarinet, it's a lot more delicate. Like, you have to you have to do more of that. You know, the more of that you do, the more likely you're going to be to seize up and stuff. And I was kind of scared of it because, like, I've never played this thing before. Yeah. And I, I was sitting, that was the, I think the third time I got into orchestra. Mm. And they do orchestra by semesters because I got in it three. I got in it in my freshman year. I went from, like, third to last out of, like, 20 people to fourth. Mm-hmm. And I got into orchestra barely and played Pines of Rome and, uh, Sammy Barra Takata Festiva. It's an organ piece. It was really cool. Hmm. Got to play that in the in our uh, chapel that we have there. With it was really cool. Hmm. But so anyway, <laughs> back back to this. I'll, I'm just good at talking for a lot. No, that's good. I need that. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so so um, I was really excited, but I was like, crap. You know, I wanted to actually play clarinet in orchestra because. I'd only gotten to do it really for one concert at the time because I was playing bass the, mm. the first time I was in orchestra. Mm. And uh, so I got to play the E-flat clarinet and we were working on some hard pieces. It was a Salome, or sorry, it was a Strauss concert, a Ricard Strauss concert. And we yeah. played Salome, um, just the opening of Salome, which is an opera by Strauss and it's just an mm. orchestral um, reimagining of it, but it's all still written by him. So mm. it's not, as if somebody recontextualized it. It's mm-hmm. just not the entire opera because, yeah. And then we played DeRozan Cavalier by him as well. And that is a ridiculously hard piece to put together. Mm-hmm. And the E flat part on it and Salome, but mostly DeRozan Cavalier is wicked. And I remember getting my music because mm-hmm. I was like, oh, good. I get to ease into E flat clarinet. And I opened my music <laughs> and I was like, Fuh. like yeah, I just. Yeah my mind got ripped apart and I was like, how am I going to learn this in like a month and a half? Sure. I don't even know how to play, play the instrument. Like, <laughs> yeah. I know how to make a sound, but I don't know how to actually play it. Mm-hmm. And I worked my, my ass off trying mm-hmm. to learn E flat. And I think that's why probably this ended up being the best experience was all that work I put in all the motivation. Cause yeah, yeah. you know, it's hard to motivate yourself, especially like, 
you know, whenever you're just being critical. Like, mm-hmm. you know, we go to school and we're taught to be critical of yeah, everything. Yeah. So it's really hard to sometimes lose sight of or easy to lose sight of why we're doing what we're doing. We're just like, oh, we suck yeah. or whatever. And I'm sure that's relatable in any, any yeah, field yeah, yeah. or aspiration. Exactly. Um, so that experience. Uh, so does, did you have to like learn different fingerings as well? Or no, is it about th- the same? Thankfully, it's about the same until you get into the higher register Mm -hmm. um, because some of the notes, like the fingerings are the exact same, Mm -hmm. but some of the tendencies are a little bit different. Um, Like regular fingerings sometimes don't come out as easily on the E flat as Mm. they would on E flat. Just it's, it's kind of weird. So you have to use some of the fake fingerings, Mm -hmm. but you, it's the same fake fingerings you would use on B flat. So, I mean, literally, yes, it's the same. It's just some of the tendencies are different. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I played, I played through it and I was struggling so hard up until a concert. Like, cause I remember I was sitting in between the principal bassoon and the principal clarinet. Mm. The principal clarinet was somebody that I really looked up to mm-hmm. and I was just getting tired of him. Like looking at me like I'm stupid mm-hmm. cause I couldn't play it. Mm-hmm. And then the day of the concert happened and I, I worked my butt off like for the last week before the concert. Like I was like, okay, I'm going to kick it into overdrive and I practice mm-hmm. like six to seven hours a day just yeah. on E flat. And so that caused my B flat lessons to be really bad for that week. But yeah, yeah. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the orchestra concert happened and everything just came out like just perfectly. Right. And it was insane. And the dude, <laughs> the guy I was talking about, his name is Brandon. He uh, turned to me after a concert and was like, it's like, you sounded really, really nice. I said, that, that was actually really good. And that, Made me feel really good. And yeah, it was yeah. probably the best overall ex- experience I've ever had. It was, mm-hmm. yeah, it was a blast. Yeah. So. And then, see, so it's really different uh, playing with an ensemble versus playing by yourself and being accompanied um, in that you sort of have other people relying on you. Mm-hmm. And that's that's sort of one big aspect in playing music that people don't see is that it it really is like a a team sport. Oh, definitely. I mean, you can, especially like you said, in in, in an ensemble setting, especially it it actually even can go in a solo setting with an accompanist. I mean, Mm -hmm. you have to be able to communicate with each other so that, because if you're playing with somebody other than just yourself, it's not just you creating the music. It's, it's, you and you're just simply a part of the piece and you exactly. have to be able to interconnect with everything mm-hmm. and together you guys make a product rather than exactly i think that's very common in solo and like with accompaniment pieces um, mm-hmm. people the soloists tend to overlook that sometimes it's like oh, the accompaniment is a part of the music too so you know integrate with it and yeah tell a story together rather than just i'm gonna show off how I can play because it's yeah, a solo piece. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and I feel like whenever people consider the aspects of doing music, like like in middle school and through high school and stuff, is that you know a lot of times it's not even really about the music itself. It's about the interactions that you have with the people in the ensemble and the like. I mean, we were both in marching band and uh, concert band. And the thing is, is that a lot of people were there, were in band, not because they loved music necessarily. Everyone loves music, but like they were there because they're friends. Right. Yeah. It was definitely, (laughs) especially in marching band, it's much more of a, which is particularly why I I don't care for it too much. (laughs) I'm more focused on the music, the expression through the music itself Mm -hmm. um, rather than socializing but i entirely understand it yeah yeah you know um you definitely want music to be welcoming like that you know i think sometimes a lot of people especially those that are ignorant to um you know the academia in music yeah think that you know we're stuck up and yeah yeah that we pretentious right and it's understandable Mm -hmm. i mean (laughs) <laughs> but you know and some people are like that but yeah some people are like that regardless of what career path you mm-hmm. tend to zone in on and yeah you know. 
<laughs> it's definitely, I think music is more about just, again, just the expression, but being able to convey it in a way that mainly it's for the listener so that they can yeah. take something from it and almost feel as if they had a social interaction with you, even though they literally have only heard you play. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so on that, I guess, uh, what has been your favorite solo piece that you've done? Um, man, that's a hard one, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because it is, and I'm vamping for you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it is, it is very different. Uh, doing an ensemble piece, yeah, whenever you're doing an ensemble piece, you're sort of contributing to the whole. As opposed to whenever you're doing a solo piece, it's more about that solo instrument itself. And while there is accompaniment, uh, it's sort of structured in a way that like, hey, look, it's this lead instrument that's sort of right, right. creating the the lead of the thing. And so um, in the solo music that I've done, uh, less so instrumentally, but more vocally, um, it's it's very different because it's like all eyes are on you and um, what you're doing Mm -hmm. is important to the whole thing. Not that like, you know, the trombone four part isn't important, but it's like having some bum, 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 bum isn't necessarily driving the entirety of the music in the same way that being the lead part of a, solo piece (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah um i don't know i have too many solo (laughs) pieces that i've enjoyed to really narrow it i think one of my favorite experiences though of um, solo work is actually not even on my my main instrument or it's still technically in an ensemble setting um Mm -hmm. i also play tenor saxophone yeah and alto saxophone and soprano saxophone. And we were, you know, in my undergraduate, I would also play along with the jazz band. And I was a lead tenor there. Mm-hmm. And uh, before I left, we played this really cool um, art adaptation of um, the Darcy James argues transit, um, which is all essentially an arc shape pattern Hmm. and it's mostly for the most part all over um just dominant pedal and (laughs) it's essentially just a solo vehicle piece and you know our director john allen um i guess he liked working with me i liked working with him a lot but Mm -hmm. he obviously i guess liked working with me to some degree because he wanted me to play it and he gave me the flugelhorn part because it's actually a solo (laughs) it's actually a solo for flugelhorn Mm -hmm. but he wanted me to play it as a kind of like a going away feature thing yeah on tenor sax cool it was really really fun yeah in the concert it was it was just the experience was amazing and that's that's one of the reasons i love improving so much is you can really just the freedom to create is almost endless like yes you have to make it make coherent sense (laughs) because you just you do it's not gonna make like you don't want to just go up there and babble like right, right. like we're doing like talking without thought <laughs> yeah. like, you know that tends to not work so well in that yeah, atmosphere yeah. in this atmosphere it's perfect but yeah <laughs> you know out on the main stage you know people are gonna be like what is this garbage or right you're gonna be thinking yeah. what is this garbage sure. <laughs> or i mean sometimes the intention doesn't get there is yeah. is to sort of like make noise that's that's, true that's more rare Uh, (laughs) that's true and if that's what you're going for that's great but yeah you know if you do that i would just advise it to be sparse ish (laughs) because you you want to convey a story or something with with what you're yeah yeah. improving and you know unlike in solo music you know yes you do have freedom to express and you have freedoms to create things or to phrase things the way that you want to Mm mm-hmm but ultimately, everything you're doing is to enhance what's already on the page. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, that's excellent because you 
that's going to be most of what you do is, you know, you, you see something and then you have to create something Mm -hmm. based off of what you have. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's one of the reasons, like I was saying, like why I like improvisation as well. And I think it's a valuable source is because it teaches you how to create because you literally have to create from nothing. There's nothing guiding you. Yeah. There's, there's some chords, right? You got a lead sheet, but like other than that, it's like, Right. Notes. And, you know, there are multiple notated solo works that don't have many dynamics in them, but just mm-hmm. seeing the shapes and stuff, you know, you can experiment and probably have a better chance of creating something that would musically work because you can visually see mm-hmm. what's happening, unlike in improv where you literally just have to fully conceptualize what you're doing yeah (laughs) you know at my at my level that i'm being you know asked to perform at obviously i have to do that all the time anyway yeah but (laughs) i that i don't know i just think improvisation has helped me a lot with that concept of you know every time you play you're you're telling something yeah you're trying to go somewhere or get away from something or Mm-hmm. You know, it's not just notes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're. It is creative. Uh, <laughs> um, just to get into like some some details, what all instruments do you play? <laughs> um, or I guess have you played? Because I guess you could like pick up another one and be like, oh, I no, I won't do that. <laughs> do that. Let's see, I play. Um, out of the saxophones, I play tenor sax the most. I mm-hmm. just like the sound of it the most. Mm-hmm. But I'm also fluent in uh, alto saxophone and soprano saxophone. Mm-hmm. And then in the clarinet world, which is my main mm-hmm. atmosphere, um, I play the standard two uh, soprano clarinets, the B flat and the A. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I play the E flat clarinet, um, the alto clarinet, the bass clarinet. <laughs> and then the contra alto clarinet contralto but i've never played the <laughs> the double contra bass. i've never played the contra bass yeah well i mean stuff gets kind of crazy mm-hmm. as well just because like everything changes well yeah i mean there's there's like a a contra bass mm-hmm. and sub contra bass of like every instrument just because someone thought like what if we just took this instrument it's like and the, made it lower. It's like the <laughs> string craze with the guitars. Yeah, exactly. But on that note too, yeah, I also play bass guitar. Yeah. And I would I never like to say that I play piano, but I improvise on piano a yeah. lot and make compositions mm-hmm. just out of pure aural. Mm-hmm. Like pure it's all aurally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, um but I don't really like play it. Mm-hmm. Although you have had to learn piano. In a traditional sense. Well, yeah, just school. for education purposes. <laughs> but I would never use that as I play piano now. Right, exactly. It's more of if I need to, I can play piano. But more importantly, I can at least teach using piano. Yes, yes. And that's, that's more of the purpose of <laughs> learning piano in an educational purpose. Um, yeah. And, okay, so earlier we were kind of talking about how the differences with like classical music and sort of not listening to classical music. What is the contemporary music that you enjoy and sort of how does that influence your music that you make through your main instruments? Do you mean contemporary as in like more popular Pop music? music? Okay. Uh, Instead of like contemporary instrumental. All that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, the most popular thing that I listen to that influences my music that I believe would be more relatable to the public would be like East coast or West coast alternative music, like Mm. stuff out of long Island or stuff from LA and stuff like that. Name Um, some artists. I'm about to (laughs) (laughs) like, I I really enjoyed taking back Sunday and brand new and um, muse and death cab for cutie. And just a lot of stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, there's kind of within that ballpark. I continuously name others. Um, whenever I was a rowdy little teenager, this doesn't influence me as much anymore, but I mm-hmm. used to be really influenced by like 
heavy, heavy um, metal or like thrash core. Yeah, yeah. Music and stuff like that, yeah. like Job for a Cowboy and yeah. Miss May I and the Red Chord and stuff <laughs> like that. But that was back whenever I was actually doing that. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fun that. fact, <laughs> you and I were in a screamo band called Dinosaur Dimension yep. for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you were the screamer and I played bass. Yeah, and then I, I, was, can, I continued that trend. I ended up same people we ended up forming a different band called for all things end and mm. we ended up uh we got invited to go on the vans warp tour or we'd gotten a record label but you know things happened for a reason and i'm glad they did because our guitarist started doing some heavy nasty drugs and hanging around like the wrong people so yeah glad i was able to get out of that atmosphere anyway yeah. that was a fun tangent <laughs> um, <laughs> um. But yeah, I mean, but, and, we also yeah. get down some uh, system of a down. Yeah, we do. <laughs> we do. Yeah, and then you know, obviously Metallica, just like the classics. But mm-hmm. honestly, the most influential type of music that has really aided me in this um, pursuit mm-hmm. of you know a career choice and just the development as an overall human being has um, right. been trance music, which is a, um, yeah, I don't know if it's a sub genre, but it's a different genre of techno. Yeah. Um, I'd say it's just, it I would goes say it, under the umbrella of EDM. Right. Pretty much. <laughs> but it's, it's very similar to techno. Um, mm-hmm. it just doesn't have the rave like qualities. Um, most mm-hmm. of the time, like usually your typical techno tracks going to be like, two and a half to four and a half, maybe five minutes at the most. Mm-hmm. And it's just like simple ABA form where, you know, it's like, oh, I'm going to build up. Oh yeah, we're at the build up. Let's party. Let's drink. Yeah. Okay. We're done partying. And then like, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where trance like is literally a giant arc. Yeah, um, yeah. It is all in arc form. And so what it does is it starts off with usually maybe one or two things going on. Um, and it slowly builds and it builds to a point and then it completely resets, so it drops off. And then it starts building back again up towards the peak or the climax. And then it has a party with the peak and the climax area. And that's usually has like anywhere from 15 to 20 different tracks going on at the mm-hmm. same time in succession. Mm-hmm. Um, creating this like euphoric feeling. Mm-hmm. Or at least with me personally. Some yeah, people yeah. may just view it as repetitive noise. <laughs> and then it winds down all the way back to where it started. Mm-hmm. So it's a modified yeah, arc yeah. almost which yeah. is really cool but you get like these really long edm tracks they're very long <laughs> they're um anywhere like a short one would be six minutes and the longest one that i actually listen to is probably 13 yeah. minutes or so and yeah it, and it's <laughs> the the type of state like just the state of mind that it puts me in like i like i mentioned earlier is just simply like euphoric and yeah, to me, it's the way music is supposed to make you feel. Yeah, um, maybe not necessarily that specific music, but sure, sure. I think that sense of uplifting and you know energy and is inside all of the music. Yeah, I, yeah. Just that's out there. I just think sometimes we forget about that. So I'm trying to find a way for myself to bring that feeling that I get from that music into what i actually do which i think yeah, i've done yeah. a decent job but it's you know there's always more things to yeah. help aid that or you can get with a producer and do a clarinet trance track that'd be cool <laughs> we'll have that'd to try that fun. at some point yeah that'd actually be really fun <laughs> i need to brush up on my edm skills um yeah uh <laughs> uh even more details about the thing earlier you were sort of describing about like the embouchure and your posture and all this stuff and that um, for those that either have never played an instrument or have never really gotten as deep into playing an instrument, you know, what are all of the things that are involved in making sound happen in a pleasurable way? (laughs) That's a loaded question. Um, That's the point. Yeah. (laughs) Do you want me to talk? (laughs) <laughs> uh, so uh essentially i mean there's not body wise there isn't as far as with clarinet there isn't 
too many things, but I mean, the things that you have to do, there are so many little things within them, Yeah, but yeah. like literally it's not much. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, there's a lot of minute things within those few things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A lot. Um, but essentially all, all you need is just, you need to learn to play relaxed with your hands. Essentially, that's something that I always struggle with. Is you know, when learning the fingers and just being able to play, you know, as if you were just gliding over the instrument. You know, everything's yeah, yeah. just coming from the third knuckle, and you're not having to work. Um, that's that's as far as on a finger thing, just a really basic thing. I could go way mm-hmm. in depth about it. But, um, <laughs> I don't feel like talking for hours. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, whenever embouchure is just like the facial tissues mm-hmm. and the muscles that are around your lip and stuff. And uh, it's just with, with clarinet, you know, I like to, if I had to put it in layman's terms, I wouldn't necessarily say this like if I was teaching, but it's all, it's very similar to if you had a milkshake and you were trying to suck on it mm-hmm. and the milk, shake just wasn't coming through the straw mm-hmm. it's it's that type of mouth tightness. position yeah, yeah very similar <laughs> but you just continue you stretch out your lips even more and close the corners and mm-hmm. blow that's yeah, the yeah. biggest thing that most people <laughs> get um you have to be able to produce air from your abdominals and have it st- and this is why you have to be relaxed even though your face is tight mm-hmm. you have to have it you know just be a wind machine and yep push the air through the instrument and the machine is also, was also a really fun jazz that piece. was a fun jazz track. <laughs> and you just push through the instrument and one of the biggest problems that people get from that is they're like okay i can do the air but when they do the air they actually over tighten their mouth and so they start biting on the mouthpiece mm-hmm. and the reed mm-hmm. and the reed is a piece of cane that you attached to the mouthpiece and that's actually what the vibrates that vibrates that makes to create the sound, the sound. yeah mm-hmm. and <laughs> yeah so yeah and biting is just such a big big problem i know so <laughs> many people that have biting problems and sometimes i have biting problems um mm. especially in certain registers where instead it, like i couldn't tell you how many times like a note would come out if i just blew air into the instrument yeah, and yeah. relaxed mm-hmm. instead of oh I may not hit this note, so I'm going to work at it, and then I mm-hmm. overcorrect everything, and then it just... Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that happens with with voice, too. It's like, oh, no, this big high note's coming up, and you, like, just tighten everything, and you're like, Ugh! and then it's like, crack. Right. It's like, if you would just let go of everything, it would have come out just fine. Right. <laughs> yeah, so that's the biggest thing. It's just a balance of... Being able to stay tense enough in your face or embouchure mm-hmm. or your facial muscles mm-hmm. so that you can have a proper um, just a, yeah, a proper embouchure so that you mm-hmm. have the setup in your face to be able to play. Mm-hmm. But s- since you have that tension, it's really easy to get tension everywhere else. Mm-hmm. So you just have to learn how to keep that there while staying completely relaxed with your really your whole body. Mm-hmm. Um I know recently I've been discovering that one of the reasons why my hand is a lot more tense than it used to be in the past is because of my calf (laughs) and the muscular tissue and the nerve endings are going from my calf all the way up my back around my shoulder and into my hand. (laughs) It's just amazing how interconnected everything is. Yeah. (laughs) And I actually learned it was because I have somehow over the course of a few years Maybe it's been all the time. Maybe it's just been a few years. It's been recent, mm-hmm. like noticeable. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Um, but I actually, when I stand, I put more weight on my right foot, but yeah. just a little bit. Yeah. So like recently <laughs> I've been trying to recenter myself, mm-hmm. but it feels like I'm leaning to the left. Yeah. It's really weird. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it's all a big interconnected yeah. web thing. But and it's, it's just funny how everything but mm. you know especially since this is what we're talking about but everything's like this it's just so simple mm-hmm. playing the clarinet is so simple <laughs> that it's hard yeah and i'm not saying that it isn't difficult and i'm not saying that it doesn't take work or effort because it surely does mm-hmm. but in reality the things that we're trying to accomplish 
are just simple. Mm -hmm. All we're trying to do is create a good sound and play as relaxed as possible. Yeah. Sounds really easy. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, at the same time, there's just stuff going on in your head. And that's, that's another reason as to why uh, music is seen as really valuable because not only are you, you know, sort of training your body as an instrument as well as working with an instrument, but you're also using all of these different parts of your brain to make music. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, you have to think of rhythm and notes mm -hmm. and you have to listen and then you have to feel in time and whatever that means. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, there's all, all the brain stuff going on. Anything to add on the brain stuff? <laughs> uh, I think that's honestly why the simplicity of it becomes difficult mm -hmm. is from a mental perspective. You yeah. just, it's so easy to create a mental block or just because something is simple and concept doesn't mean it's easy to conceptualize. Mm. Um, so it's simply just being aware. Like yeah. that's the biggest reason we have teachers and that's the biggest reason why, you know, we tried to teach other people is because, you know, once you learn, once you're aware of everything that you need to do, you are your best teacher mm -hmm. because you know what you need to do and you just do it. Yeah. But we need teachers and we need people in the educational field to help guide people. Yeah. To not only make them aware of what they need to do, but even keep the people in line that are aware of what they need to do mm -hmm. so that, you know, some people need people like that because otherwise they'd feel lost or they don't. You know, hopefully this isn't the case, but, you know, maybe they're not motivated enough to do it on their own, mm -hmm. which, you know, at some point, if they really wanted to do it, they would be motivated <laughs> enough. But maybe that's all they need is that little push, you know? Yeah, yeah. And that support will help the mental cloudiness kind of go away. And then, mm -hmm. like you said, it's anything in life. Just once you open up and are simply aware of everything mm -hmm. and you work on it. It, it it fixes itself over time, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you do big? have to work on it. Oh, of it, course. It doesn't, you don't just think about it and then, oh, cool, I figured out the answer, course. I'm done. That's just the, that's just the <laughs> beginning. Yeah, yeah. Um, last thing on this topic, uh, but it gets a little bit broader. Um, for as long as I've known you uh, as a musician... You've been very uh, gifted in that you you sort of start off at like farther down the race per se, mm -hmm. um, and um, you know a lot of people. It feels like in American culture that there's a lot of value in talent, but less thought of is the value of skill. Um, in that talent is just sort of what you're born with, but skill is what you have to work at to get to. And for as long as I've known you, you've had a lot of talent, but also you put in the extra work to make those skills happen. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, kind of like you were saying earlier that, uh, whenever you started music, like in middle school and high school, it was like, eh, I don't feel really challenged by this. Um, so how has that changed over time as you've gotten better as a musician and sort of grown past the talent part? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I understand what you're asking. I, th I honestly think what I'm about to say is applicable to anybody mm -hmm. who wants to do anything. Yes. Regardless of <laughs> whether or not they have quote unquote talent. I don't mm -hmm. necessarily believe in, like I believe in talent, but I don't think like you said, in American culture, for some reason, a lot of the times people think if you don't have the talent, you're not going to be able to have the skill. Exactly. Which is not the case. That just means you're going to have to put in more work. More work. Mm -hmm. But there comes a time where you guys have to put in the same amount of work because mm -hmm. you'll catch up. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a thing. And if you catch up to somebody like that, you're already going to have that working in your favor. So exactly, you'll eventually go ahead because they're used to working at a different pace because they started somewhere else exactly but as far as the transition 
to that line of thinking. It honestly just came from when I started to pursue it. I wasn't interested in like, you know, like I said, the stuff that I was doing, you know, like you said, I wasn't very challenged. Yeah. But once I decided to see what it was about Mm -hmm. and I started getting challenged, Mm -hmm. that's whenever it was kind of a wake up moment for me. I was like, Mm -hmm. well, shit, if I really want to do this, I got to actually like I can't just rely on what I have. Yeah. Like I have to improve what what I have. And yeah, that's kind of just over the course of many years of doing that that Mm -hmm. has caused me to be able to see that change and where you know what i what i initially had doesn't matter because i have to get to to here anyway Mm -hmm. you know yeah yeah um yeah and then that's something that i asked you earlier whenever you were playing is that like at some point you kind of reach the uh asymptotic which is very you know good old academia word uh (laughs) Um, but like you, you reach the sort of asymptotic limits of improvement. Mm -hmm. Um, but you, you don't get to that place without first, you know, getting past Mm -hmm. your talents, right? You, you keep going and get to your skills. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, we'll go ahead and pause <laughs> to transition. Um, because there's never a good way to get into this next part. Um, uh, uh, spirituality and religion, and all that mess. Uh, so the question as it goes is what is the role of spirituality or religion in your life? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just thinking. Yeah, that's all right. Um, <laughs> I think it plays a pretty pretty <laughs> heavy role in what, what I at least try to do. Maybe I don't reflect it very well, but mm. I'm not really, although I am technically religious, I don't really like religion. Mm-hmm. very much i think it's a little bit too um exclusive <laughs> yeah um just because i think it's all tainted by the fault of man and all that stuff and mm-hmm. i could talk about that forever but well, let's yeah <laughs> but and that's just due to my past i've had some bad history with like churches and stuff and mm-hmm. just being excluded out of things because whether a couple times i can think of honestly it was my own fault Mm-hmm. You know, I wasn't honest or I uh, lied to somebody or I, you know, I did something to make that experience bad, yeah. but it nonetheless still had a negative effect of my viewpoint of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then other times it was just, I just didn't feel like I belonged where I was. Um, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I've I've incorporated a lot of other, you know, sp- you know, spiritual philosophies and stuff into yeah, yeah. what I practice um because i just i think it's the right thing to do i think just being more spiritually aware of the universe around you Mm -hmm. is more important than um sitting in a building for an hour and giving money Mm -hmm. Um, and that's that's what i associate with the word religion so i have a very biased context that's Um, what a lot of people associate with the word religion yeah (laughs) i just i think it's too um mundane i don't really Mm -hmm. think you're feeding you know although religious people claim that they're spiritual Mm -hmm. i don't think it necessarily feeds your soul the way it wants to be fed Mm -hmm. because you know church and religious context they're not supposed to be the structure of your faith if you choose to have one it's Mm -hmm. simply supposed to be a reminder Mm -hmm. of you know one you're not alone and two that hey it's kind of like it's kind of like a checkup almost you know Mm -hmm. just like are you are you doing what you what you should be doing and if not you know either do it or decide whether or not this is actually fits your philosophical lifestyle you know yeah (laughs) (laughs) 
Yeah. And it's not like you should be forced to believe something. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Um, and you said sort of like good thing to do. So what are like, what is good things to do? How do you good? <laughs> How do you, well, that's a very subjective question. Um, <laughs> Honestly, you just got to, and I know this sounds cliche, especially in, I love cliches. in today's generation <laughs> and age, you know, um, but honestly, you just got to find, you got to find something that you can really honestly just relate to mm-hmm. on, a, on a spiritual level mm-hmm. and take things with a grain of salt when it comes to those kind of things, other than the principal values, because mm-hmm. If you're looking for something, if you're not, that's great. You've already found what what suits you best, and that's Mm -hmm. amazing. But if you are looking for something, you can't expect it to be perfect because Mm -hmm. what you're going to be told is simply words out of another human being's mouth, Mm -hmm. and that's it. And Mm -hmm. that's up to you. And you have to experiment that with that on your own if Mm -hmm. you're interested and be like, oh, does you know, Buddhism in- interests me or something based on, you know, the concept of nirvana and all this stuff. And right, right. if you really are interested in it, then experiment with it and mm-hmm. see if it's really what you thought it was or not. Or mm-hmm. because you, you just can't, and that's the biggest fault in like Christianity today is, um, although it's the world's most popular religion by, you know, just sheer numbers. Uh, I the, don't I think, is it, is it still that way now? Uh, I can look it up as you keep going. Okay. <laughs> if, I, if I recall right, Christianity is the world's largest religion. In the yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it could have changed. Anyway, but I think there's a big fault in that because, you know, people just grow up in it and then they blindly mm-hmm. follow it. So I don't really think that most Christian people and maybe I'm just this skeptic because I'm I'm a I'm a follower myself. Mm-hmm. But I don't think most Christian people are truly, honestly, Christian, and I don't mm-hmm. think they follow the true principles that are written mm-hmm. in the New Testament. I think they just simply read it, mm-hmm. and sometimes they don't even read it. Sometimes they just go to church because Mm -hmm. it's the right thing to do. And, Oh, this is a thing to believe because my parents believe it Mm -hmm. or my family does. And I don't want to be the odd man out. Mm -hmm. And, and that's what I was talking about with, you know, cause I'm a very, not, not to sound like narcissistic or self-indulged or anything, Mm -hmm. but I have a very unique philosophy of, of Christianity because I incorporate other quote unquote religious um, philosophies into that same concept. Like I mm-hmm. practice a lot of Taoism as mm-hmm. well. And I think the f- philosophies that are in there are very similar to yeah, yeah. Christian philosophy. Same with Buddhism, same with Islam, even mm-hmm. in some cases, yeah. you know, uh, by the way, yeah, I just looked it up and, uh, Christianity is, uh, the largest religion, uh, followed by, uh, Islam. Islam. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and I, I, you know, if we were actually to somehow be able to get the truth serum out, I don't think it would be that big on mm-hmm. Christianity. I think a lot of people are just blind followers. Right. right. And I think that's like that in most, any religion, honestly, mm-hmm. there's going to be mm-hmm. blind followers. I just think there are more in there because, well, there's more of them, mm-hmm. you know, because especially like here in Oklahoma is, it's gotten a lot better since, you know, I've grown up. But when I was right. a kid, <laughs> very, very pressured to go to church. Mm-hmm. But what am I going to gain in church as a, as a two and a half year old that can't <laughs> even talk? I can't even conceptualize these things. Yeah, yeah. So, but the thing is, if you get people in there early enough, it becomes a habit. Mm-hmm. And you can potentially have them be stuck there, mm-hmm. even if they don't necessarily belong there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's what I've always tried to do is just. Do do what I'm told to do and accept everybody and love everybody unconditionally, even though I may not necessarily agree with them. I yeah. don't have to agree with them on everything. Mm-hmm. That's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. And I shouldn't <laughs> chastise somebody just because they think something different of me. Instead, I should embrace it and maybe see if I can incorporate some of their ideas into my 
way, like translate it into my way of faith and my way of thinking because mm -hmm. we all have something. I think we all have a piece of the puzzle mm -hmm. in terms of at least how to behave on the earth mm -hmm. towards each other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, nobody, well, some extreme groups, but that doesn't count because that doesn't actually follow the principles. Right. But everybody just wants to be at peace with each other. Mm. We just choose to have boundaries mm. because we want to be right. But mm. you can be right and, you know, not be a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, questions that I force myself to ask. Uh, uh, more so because it's it's important to figure out, but also because it's funny uh, to me. <laughs> uh, God? Question mark. Does God exist? Uh, <laughs> do you believe in God? Well, I do. Yes, but right. That's all I'm asking. Okay. Do you believe in God? <laughs> yes. I, I don't know That's about a, anyone else. You're the only one I'm talking to. Fair enough. Um. So yes, uh, do you want to clarify on that, or is it is it the, you know, beard cloud man, or is it a little bit more? No, I mean, than that? I think the conceptualization of it being that person is the same, but I don't. I think it's more of instead of like a god that is so sectionalized or you know i don't i don't think it's the same as in the old testament where it's full of curses and full of just like raining haterade mm -hmm. on humanity <laughs> um which is fine i mean he was probably angry but i think it's more <laughs> of a welcoming and loving approach and everybody mm -hmm. like oh yeah i don't really know how to how to explain it just because it's hard to explain mm -hmm. but i think it's more welcoming of all of these ideologies because we're all rooted in the same thing mm. you know we all want the same thing to happen here on earth at yeah. least if you're sane I would, hope. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope that no sane person wants everybody to die chaos right you know but yeah i mean i, I guess technically yeah i believe in the stereotypical god but i <laughs> believe in him in a different sure. way yeah than the traditional method yeah and then the second of these, uh, free will, question mark. Like, do I believe in the con? Like, do I yeah, believe in free will? free will? Yeah. Or like predetermination? Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah. Usually the choice goes free will or determinism. No. Yeah. I, I believe in free will. Okay. Uh, do, what is your definition of free will? <laughs> Never really had to define this. It's going to sound choppy. That's fine. Um, <laughs> My definition of free will is literally just that. I think it's we, although there are consequences to the things that we do, be it positive or negative, we have a choice to, you know, do the actions that, unless we have like a predisposed mental condition or something, we mm -hmm. have a choice to perform the actions that we're going to perform mm -hmm. or believe in what we're going to believe in. I don't think there's, mm -hmm. I don't think there's a puppet master in the sky like, <laughs> making you think that you, you know, mm -hmm. we're going to take road B on your own, but in reality, they just kind of nudged you there anyway. Mm -hmm. or, you know, I'm not a big believer in determinism just because I, I don't really think it's a healthy way of thinking. <laughs> um, I think we we'll talk about that later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Just to me. And I, maybe it's just cause I'm ignorant to it, but from what I know of it, it's mm. just almost an apathetic way of, looking at life because and maybe it's just the way mm -hmm. i would perceive it sure if, if i was that, that way yeah, yeah, yeah. because i know if i believed it that way and obviously it's the only con concept i'm going to understand mm. i would not want to live because i would just feel like well there's no point because everything's mm -hmm. going to happen anyway so it doesn't matter what i do mm. and unfortunately i'm mentally susceptible enough to where that would be <laughs> enough to <laughs> to not have me want to want to keep going <laughs> so for that reason yes i believe in free will okay, okay. so um yeah. <laughs> yeah um so what are some things going on in the world that you uh wish people would change <laughs> i 
And yeah. it's really just the first thing that comes to me. Yeah, I know. I'm just <laughs> thinking of how to word it. <laughs> Honestly, it's just that. I just wish the world was more of a community mm-hmm. rather than a bunch of individualized you know, it's okay to have individualized beliefs and political mm-hmm. systems and stuff like this. It's just a matter of acceptance. Mm-hmm. We we have to understand that to pe- to other people, there are other ways to do things. Now, yeah. that being said, um, there are some things that we can't have mm-hmm. because of immorality. Mm-hmm. But the basic immoral philosophies like, you know, killing somebody, mm-hmm. most, again... 99.99% <laughs> of people are not going to want to justify murdering somebody. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just immoral. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, unless, again, there are the few cases where you have people that can't control that and they yeah. just have a mental condition where they have an urge. But I don't count that because it's just an exception. Mm-hmm. There's always an exception. Sure. And that, that's the biggest thing. I think if we just simply came together on our problems instead of trying to you know, fix ourselves by pushing everybody else away mm-hmm. or by stomping on our enemies or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we would be able to solve a lot of the problems that we have in the world and a lot mm-hmm. of the, especially in resources, because mm-hmm. a lot of the problems that I can think of off the top of my head that we have are due to lack of resources, mm-hmm. but we actually don't have a lack of resources. Yeah. It's just a power thing. Mm-hmm. Is a simulated uh, lack of resources. Right. And, you know, of course, there will be a time where, yes, we probably will have a true lack of resources mm-hmm. due to the population increasing, like, bunny rabbits on a bunny parade. Yeah, and then the but, decreasing of, like, availability of water. But that happens. Mm-hmm. But as of right now, that's not the case. You know, mm-hmm. so. Yeah. Um, mm. And then, of course, got to touch a little bit on the <laughs> politics. Oh, boy. Uh, oh boy, indeed. Um, so, uh, wh- how do you how do you feel about the the current political climate? Where uh, <laughs> in the world? In I mean, we can start in the U.S. and then expand a little bit bro- broader. Fudge, dude. <laughs> Man, these questions are so <laughs> fruitful. Yeah, um, I like them. <laughs> Makes me think. You know. I have never been a fan of politics. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it is so my my hatred for what's going on in the entire world right now is so bad to the point where unfortunately, I'm doing the worst thing possible mm. and avoiding it. Yeah, yeah. Because I just simply cannot. Yeah. I just, I can't. Mm-hmm. I don't even I don't have the energy to even think about this stuff that's happening. Mm-hmm. And I think some things to are maybe a little bit exaggerated in terms of like the uh i don't know the amount of havoc that something yeah, yeah. has or the amount of positive you know feedback that something gets it's all subjective mm-hmm. um especially in a country like here where we have all these different viewpoints and philosophies you know that's just mm-hmm. comes to being a melting pot culture you're not going to agree on every little thing mm-hmm. and you're always going to have a different utopia in your head mm. But again, I just, I think it's too, I think it's become less about true politics in terms of trying to better the community and then the at large, the state and the nation and the Mm -hmm. world, you know, just the typical hierarchy. Yeah. I think it's become less about that and more, again, just on a power level, Mm -hmm. more about the money and more about the power that Mm -hmm. you can obtain from these political positions. Um, Yeah. Which is the reason why I've, and it's like that all across the world. It's just in different variants, whether it be one dude Mm -hmm. or a whole government or no government. Yeah. Um, Even if there's no government, there's some force that is doing Mm -hmm. that. It's just the way, the way it is. Mm -hmm. Um, And the countries that don't apply to any of those, I'm not aware of. Because we don't get told about them. Yeah. So <laughs> there you go about how selfish we are. Yeah. But, 
<laughs> and uh, yeah, because I think, and I'm not saying that people that are politicians are bad, mm. but I'm also saying that politicians are bad <laughs> because they are bad at their jobs right now. It seems I, I don't even think they're bad at their jobs. I think they're just not fit to be there mm. because they get transformed into that by the temptation of people like these big corporate banks or these mm-hmm. businesses that have the money to be able to influence the political sphere. Yeah. Um, because, you know, Billy Bob growing up <laughs> going to college, I doubt he's like, I want to go into politics to fuck shit up. Like, yeah, yeah. I doubt he's, I'm <laughs> sure he's got all these ideas mm-hmm. that he's willing to change. But as he gets farther into the political industry, what he, what he'll learn is what, what he wants doesn't matter mm. because all that matters is, you got to have the money and the power to be able to continually win mm-hmm. things or to continually rise in the political atmosphere. Mm-hmm. And so eventually, by the time you get in a position of power like Trump or in the Senate or in the House of Reps or mm-hmm. even on a state level in the state government, mm-hmm. you kind of I, – I just fear that with all that power getting mm-hmm. fed at you and all that income, you lose your reasoning for why you were doing what you're doing or you lose yeah, yeah. your – you lose your want to stand up for what you wanted to do in the first place. Yeah. And so by the time you get there, you don't do it. And you're just simply a pawn that people like me blame because I don't know who's <laughs> actually controlling mm-hmm. the decisions. Yeah. And I don't have the income to, especially in the United States, I don't have the income to be able to, to influence anything. Right. So <laughs> I just sit here like fuck or <laughs> yay, but there is literally no control I have. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's my view of politics, and that's yeah. that's one of the reasons I've chosen to. I've had to distance myself from my mm-hmm. own sanity. Yeah, exactly, and I, I don't blame you, because <laughs> um, yeah, it's kind of a shitstorm. Um, so then, with all of these uh, philosophies that are sort of forming your principles, um, how does that relate back into music, and how does how do these principles affect music and how does music sort of reflect the principles? Well, that's, that's a good question. (laughs) So like, I think the biggest principle that applies to what I strive to do, maybe I don't Mm -hmm. successfully do it, but what I strive to do in the musical world Mm -hmm. is to simply spread this ideology of the community atmosphere Mm -hmm. and that everybody should love one another unconditionally regardless of what they do and the way i try to implement that musically is just to get people together Mm -hmm. so that you know for one common purpose to listen to music or to play music and just simply enjoy the atmosphere that is around them and socialize and you know not like in marching band socialization but (laughs) you know just that and then in terms of politics and you know i think another aspect i as a performer want to temporarily take the stress of life away from somebody Mm -hmm. and just distract them for a little bit so that they can actually enjoy a moment of their life. You know, how many times Mm -hmm. in today's society, like, I I hope, I hope this is not true, but Mm -hmm. it just seems like the further and further we get either in age or in career development or in Mm -hmm. anything, the less we remember to just, you know, life's just about enjoying Mm -hmm. the things around you because it's only going to really happen a few times, sometimes only once, Mm. and then you're dead. Mm. And then no matter what happens after you die, you're never going to get to experience this again. Mm. So why do we waste Mm. time just stressing? Think of, you know, a typical, let's just say an 80-year-old man. Mm -hmm. How many of those years in time was wasted with stress Mm -hmm. and just worrying and just being sad or just being depressed or mm-hmm. and it's it's unfortunate because that's just the society that we live in where we're 
taught to, mm. well, if I don't, if I don't do well mm. in whatever I'm told that I'm good at, or if I don't make money, then I'm yeah, not yeah. a success. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not a success, I'm a failure. If I'm a failure, then it, it just goes on and on, you know? Yeah, yeah. But that's what I try to do with, with music um, in terms of that. And I try to do that through, or I guess by showing, trying to show rather, I guess, mm -hmm. um, the music that influenced me. Mm -hmm. Um, and just translating that to a different type of music so that people can just enjoy things and so that people can just have a good time and mm -hmm. get away from the world around them. And, you know, and as far as that's all on the performance end, as far as on the teaching end, I just want to, you know, have kids believe in something, you know? Yeah. Because I think nowadays, especially in music or anything that isn't guaranteed income, it's really difficult to get kids to have the motivation to do it. Yeah. Especially in the United States. Because mm -hmm. like I said, we're a very money-driven country. Mm -hmm. And I just think we need to, instead of turning the kids away mm -hmm. and being like, oh, you shouldn't do music because... It doesn't pay well or whatever. And it doesn't. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> it does if you're very lucky. Yeah. And not not like just luck. Obviously, you have to have the skill to do it. But Right. But there are hundreds right, of thousands of other people that <laughs> have the same skill. So, mm -hmm. But, you know, instead of shooing them away, why don't we just encourage them to do it? Because we all only live here once to our knowledge. Mm -hmm. So why would we waste time doing something we don't want to do? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and that, that's what I try to do through, hopefully mm -hmm. that makes sense. That's what I try to culminate in all of that is just, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, my last question, which you might've already answered in this whole thing, but, uh, what advice do you have for people? What advice do I have for people? Yeah. Hmm. I don't <laughs> like giving advice. <laughs> <laughs> It's not my uh, forte, or maybe it is, and I just don't know it. <laughs> yeah. But um, honestly, my my advice would just, again, just kind of what I was talking about. Just yeah. do, as long as it's not harmful to yourself or anybody around you, mm -hmm. do what you would like to do with your life. Because, again, to our knowledge, we're only going to get this opportunity once, mm -hmm. and no matter how old you are, you can do what you want to do yeah. because you're only as old as you feel. I know several like 70 to 80 year olds, even some 90 year olds mm -hmm. that are like, I, I've asked them before, like, how old do you feel? Honestly, mm -hmm. oh, I feel like I'm 20. Yeah. And they act like they're 20. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and you may be busy with, you know, life that happens, but I don't know. Just don't get bogged down or don't ever do something just because you know you feel like it's the right thing to do only do something if you know it's the right thing to do because if you waste time doing something because you're like yeah i don't really feel like it the thing that you were supposed to probably pick is gonna pop up whenever you can't do it anymore because you were wasting time mm -hmm. focusing on something else yeah follow your passion cliche <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> Uh, yeah. I mean, I enjoy cliches because at some point there's a level there's a of, lot of there's a lot of validity in them. That's yeah. why they're still around. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, thank you for doing this with me. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Um, I don't know if you have like a social media presence or whatever, uh, where can people find you and your stuff? Uh, I don't really have much of one yet. <laughs> if you feel like stalking me, you can find me on Facebook through <laughs> Santiago's friends. If yeah, I guess. With them. Uh, but if you're friends with him, you're probably friends with me. But yeah, maybe <laughs> <laughs> you're more than welcome to do that. Um, on there, you would see like my a couple recitals that I did and oh, yeah, some yeah. photographs and stuff like that. Yeah. But yeah, Jeff plays the clarinet real, real good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, maybe at some point. Uh, you can get some recordings and um, also since I'm going to be uh, composing some stuff 
um, maybe I can get some uh, recordings from you. Uh, you can just, I don't know, we'll find a way to. Yes, I mean, I have, have recordings. Yeah, I just have, don't, I don't have a way where like people can publicly access them. Right, but right. Yeah, I can send them to you. Yeah. Um, or if anybody is listening to this interested, just let me know. Yeah, cool. Uh, or if you need like, oh, I'm in dire need of this thing. Can you send me a recording of here's the sheet music or whatever? People need studio musicians all the time. Um, yeah, that's honestly something I would like to do as well. Yeah, it'd yeah. be fun. Um, yeah. Well, again, thank you. I'm yeah. Santiago Ramones. Thank you. I'm Jeff Newell. Um, you can find all the stuff that I do on my website, SantiagoRamones.com, because I do exist on the internet. Uh, <laughs> that's a good thing. And um, you can find this podcast. I also make music. I have songwritery stuff on Bandcamp, and I have uh, composery ambient stuff on SoundCloud. But you can all find that. You can find all of that. How do words order? Uh, you can find all of that on my website, on the music page. Um, you can download or pay money for uh, Songs with Words demo, which is uh, some songs that I wrote with words uh, <laughs> and That's sang and played on them. The, uh, the ambient stuff. Um, yeah, or you can listen to the stuff on my SoundCloud. Um, I always end my podcast with my three things. They shape my life philosophy. Those three things are love never fails, it's going to be okay, I might be wrong.